Caging Skies, the book that this film is based on, there you go, um, has something in common with your film, but a lot of things not in common with your film. I'm curious about when you read this and what you seized upon it, what you seized upon it that made you want to tell this story. Yeah, so my um, 2010, my mother was reading this book, not that copy, um, <laughs> and her own copy. I've got many great stories like this. Uh, and she said, this story is so boring. She said, you should make this into a movie. And she described the story to me. And um, it, but the way she described it, it was sort of, it, she sort of said, the, you know, it's about this boy and the Hitler youth who was, you know, he finds out his mother's hiding this girl in, in their attic. And, and it, she sort of made it sound a little bit like let the right one in. Like it was like <laughs> the, that he thought that there was a monster in his attic. And so, and so I, and I read the book and the book is, is it's a really good book, but it's, um, this is not really how she, described it and um it's a lot darker it's a, it's a very dark book and so i but i did love the idea of this this kid who i like the challenge of starting a film with a kid who we sort of want to hate really uh just because of who he is and how he's been you know like indoctrined into this thing and his attitudes and i like the idea of that being sort of torn away and and him changing and making a really big change by the end and so i took the the sort of the bones of that story the you know the, him and Elsa's relationship and you know i wrote that into a script and then um added hitler and jokes and were you the first choice to play hitler oh i mean obviously look at me <laughs> When that uh, casting thing comes along for, to play an Aryan uh, who, you know, <laughs> in Nazi Germany, first person you'd think of is a Polynesian Jew. <laughs> so no, it wasn't. Uh, I wrote so when I wrote it, and, and uh, okay, in the so it was like 2011. I finished the script. I had no intention of playing that character, and we sort of sent the script out and. Um, just to, to agents to see who might be interested in this thing. And, but at that very time, at that very moment, we, Jermaine and I got financing to make What We Do in the Shadows. And so I went back to New Zealand and made that, then got distracted again and made Hunt for the Wilder People, then got distracted again and made four. And then after three films, we remembered, oh, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> and, um, and then decided to make it. And that's when Fox Searchlight read it and they loved it and they said, we want to make it, but we only want to make it if you play Hitler. So it's their fault. But the upside of your waiting those years is Roman would have been about one year old and not really ready to play JoJo, so it's good would you Would have waited. been harder. Yeah. Um, Roman, do you remember your first meeting with Taika or how you found out about this, this film? Yeah. I mean, it was on a Skype call and um, it didn't go particularly well. Um, <coughs> every time we say a direction, um, I just had so much good luck that he'd and then that'd be great. He just completely. I'd, fr I'd freeze. Yeah, freeze. That's the word. Um, <laughs> and it, I, two ones. I just thought. <laughs> I, I have to do this all the time now. Yeah. Uh, no, I just thought I didn't get the part, and I thought, God, I'm going home and just sleeping for now on. I just felt so embarrassed. I was like, oh God, the guy probably thinks I'm this really narcissistic ten-year-old that won't do anything he's told. Uh, but no, he didn't really, which is. <laughs> I did think that, but that's what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> what did you see in Roman that made him right for the part? Um, I'm going to give you a compliment now. I don't usually do this. Um, the uh, Roman is um, very sensitive and emotionally uh, mature, emotionally connected. And so the thing about Roman, uh, this is true, he, he, he cares deeply about people. And um, whenever I'm casting children i try and find i try and find kids that are as close as possible to the character i've written and um and that's really like most of the work is done then they just need to learn their lines and then uh say them <laughs> fast um so yeah so and so you know I, I, it was a big sense of relief to find roman and also thomason as well who um who auditioned very early on and was basically <laughs> Basically, was the, the front runner from that moment on. 
Thomason, there are ways that we've seen this character in the past, and it's often as survivor slash victim, and yet I think the way you play Elsa, she is like the coolest girl uh, who is in an unfortunate, horrible circumstance, but she is really in control of what's going to happen to her. She is a powerful person and not somebody who has been victimized. Yeah, I think that was something that was really important to Taika and I was to, yes, obviously Elsa is a victim and has is going through a really, really monstrous time in history. She is also, that's the fact that she is a victim isn't what defines her. She is really, she's strong and courageous and, and smart and kind and caring and has so many other things and has so many layers just like onions and Shrek. And she, yeah, she's a cool kid, and, and I think Taika and I wanted to show that. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Sam, when you were thinking about research, are there films you could draw upon for gay Nazis? What is the, um, <laughs> what is the, uh, <laughs> what is the canon there? Um, no, not really. I couldn't, uh, but I did watch The Young Lions, um, and I watched uh, Ray Fiennes and Schindler's List, and I watched Oscar Vern and Ship of Fools. But we talked about Bill Murray, actually. <laughs> Like stripes, Bill Murray. Yeah, yeah. And, and sort of a. If Bill Murray was had a German accent, he was a disillusioned Nazi. That was sort of the. Uh, yeah, that was my Mean Girls. Yeah, stripes and meatballs. Yeah. Sam, I want to ask you about how Taika works and what he gives actors. How much you are able to depart? How much you're able to improvise? What are the rules on set? And how do you make sure you're getting the tone right? It, it, I think we just wanted to play it real. I think Taika's just really. Uh, charismatic and charming, as you can see, and he uh, he gives. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a very freeing environment, you know. You you have you have a lot of fun, and uh, but there wasn't uh, as much ad libbing. I mean, I, I think I feel like you and Stephen ad libbed more, maybe. Yeah, were, I mean, you guys were. The script was such a good template, and the the characters, uh, obviously, probably Stephen and I were the strong Nazi stereotypes. <laughs> Um, and so we kind of got that brief and, and went with it. And Taika would like, like a lot of options as well. So, yeah, it was, it was hard to, to improvise a lot of the stuff. Um, uh, it's uncomfortable. One time I think you made me do a run for like ten minutes about Jewish noses. <laughs> and, um, and then the head of Fox was watching and he had an <laughs> incredibly big nose. And... Um, <laughs> I only knew he was in the room at the end of the 10 minute run. And Taika kept on encouraging me, like, yeah, just I didn't. keep going. I did not. They hide gold I said, in stop. their nose, they, all this. And I was saying, you should stop. I called no, 10 he, minutes he, ago. He really wasn't. He really wasn't. And I um, haven't worked for Fox since. You so. won't. And you won't ever again. Uh. But my friends at Fox um, have been very supportive. <laughs> But Rebel, I think it's also important what's happening in the world at this time in the war, and that is that obviously the war is going badly, and characters like yours see an opportunity that women are going to be on the front lines along with young children very soon. And even though Fraulein Rom... Which happened by the, by the end, um, the women were really holding the machine guns. and Yeah, so I liked that, that was, that's kind of referenced in the film. There's a lot of stuff that I think, when, if, you were, you know, if you're watching this, you might think that's a bit over the top. But most of the stuff in the film um, around the, the city and, and, and everything, um, I researched and it's based on factual stuff. Like all the, the kids dressed as robots and toothpaste tubes, there's photos of that. that's what they made them do, walk around getting metal so they could <laughs> make more bombs. Um, and, and a lot of my dialogue was taken from real um, teaching books. So it, it sounds a bit like jokes, but they were actually... Uh, real sentences. I'm wondering if that is actually something that's mirrored in your own life, that you meet people who may not be knowledgeable about what happened during the war and about death camps and about the Holocaust. A lot of people have been unsure about this film because of the, the fact that it's a comedy about World War II and are scared that it maybe it's too early or not appropriate. And I think it's important that it's a comedy and it's a important that we're looking at it through a young person uh, person's eyes because that makes it much more accessible to the younger generations and 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 isn't a movie where you feel like you're being taught to listen it's a movie where you feel like you're being included in the conversation i guess 
Yeah, Stephen Merchant, who isn't here, um, he's, he, he, he told a story, which I'm sure most of you know, about Groucho Marx, and I think it was probably butchering the story, but um, about his uh, daughter, I guess, in, um, in way back, 30s, who um, wasn't allowed to swim in, uh, in a pool in Beverly Hills because she was Jewish. And rather than... Um, Rather than than respond with vitriol and and you know and attack the manager of this place, he you know in typical Groucho way and this is like the point is that comedy is a very very important and and um, and strong weapon against ideals and doctrines and things like that 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 really are based in sort of absurdity, and he replied back with a letter that said, well to be fair she's half Jewish so would you consider letting her into the pool up to her waist. <laughs> And if you can respond, you know, well. in a very intelligent way and poke fun and pull the thread, you know, away that is sort of holding up this sort of flimsy uh, belief, then it's a, I think it's a much more powerful way and a much more effective way um, of attacking that. I'm wondering how you saw this parent, missing parent, missing mother story fitting into what you've done before and why that's an important thing for you to explore as a filmmaker. Well, my films are usually uh, yeah they're usually about um, children and, and their parents or father figures or mother figures. This previously I, th I guess they've been more um, father centric, and this one is really a love letter to to mothers, um, in particular my mother and also solo mothers and solo parents I guess. Who it wasn't until I became a parent that I realised the sacrifices that parents go through and just how hard it is to raise a kid. Um, and so, but you know, it coupled with being a parent in a time like this where you know you're losing your child to the other side to you know to um indoctrination and being brainwashed by the bad guys and you know for in the hitler youth when these kids went in one of the first things they were taught was to rebel against your parents don't listen to your parents just listen to us and if they say anything about us or anything that's negative towards the party tell us and we'll deal with them and so if she knew that and every parent knew that it's a very tough situation to be in. You can't just, you know, come out and say, you shouldn't be a Nazi. It's not, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not as simple as that for her. And Scarlett, I think, did such a brilliant job. And um, I think she's just incredible in this film. And a lot of that character, when I was writing it, I was inspired by um, Alan Burstyn and Alice doesn't live here anymore because I think it's one of the great solo mother characters. And, um, and yeah, I think it's... She's really the only sane person in the film, and mm -hmm. I think that's like, and her and Thomas and basically the, apart from not not you, Rebel, but the um, <laughs> these two women, those two women are like the ones that you really like are rooting for, and you want, you know, and they seem to be the only grounded characters. Really. You shot interiors for this film at Berendorf Studios. Berendorf Studios during the war was taken over by a company called Prague Film that was run by Joseph Goebbels, and they made 82 films during the war at Berendorf that were propaganda films, obviously. I don't want to say, I, don't, I do not support Berendorf <laughs> Studios, okay? They're terrible, <laughs> terrible studios. <laughs> A lot of good films have come out of Berendorf since then, but it made me think about the power of film and what movies can be used for, for better and for worse. And I guess, were you ever aware of that history while you were filming? And does it start to make you think about how this film, especially for a younger generation, can fill a void that seems uh, to need filling. Yeah, the, I, I was aware of the the history of Barandov, and um, and it was extremely weird walking around the corridors, and not just with our films, but seeing other actors and extras walking around with you know these German uniforms on. I mean, they make so many um, World War Two films there, um, so <laughs> even that's weird. And just knowing, I guess, yeah, the history and like this, you know, that's it's not ghosts, but there's like a sort of you know there's the residue in those studios that that I was very aware of and um, and it's a, in a similar way when I first put on that that um, Hitler costume and that moustache which he ruined for everyone um, the moustache and the haircut and stuff and I looked in the mirror and usually if I'm playing something you know you know I'm, I'm embracing that character and, I'm, and this time it was just I was basically just embarrassed um, to look in the mirror, and, I, was like, and I just really, really felt like this was a sort of weight on my shoulders, and I think I probably spent most of the shoot like sort of slumped over like this, and just sort of sad that I had to look like that. Um, but then, 
it's also very hard to direct someone and then realize <laughs> what they're looking at you in a strange way. <laughs> And then you catch you, a reflection of yourself in something and you're like, oh, God, that's right. Um, so anyway, um, could you try and do it like this uh, next time? Uh, that's not, and look, you don't have to. That's not an order. You know, you used to. Um, but I had to try and, like, own it um, and own that character. And I I'd convinced myself that repurposing those clothes or repurposing that look and also repurposing Barandoff Studios to make films for good and films that are full of hope and are trying to make a difference or change someone's attitude is really the, that, is, that was like the kind of positive take and that bolstered me a lot in, in, in going forward and I sort of, yeah, somehow perversely enjoyed possessing Hitler and, and, yeah, and like making him do whatever I wanted which was just making him a complete idiot. Thanks for coming out. Thank you, everyone.